Coming up on Art Rocks, combining familiar skylines with digital devices to reveal the perils of climate change. Using smoke and flame to create, not destroy, live theatre reveals the workings of a different kind of mind. And a young singer-songwriter's unique view of life. That's all about to happen on Art Rocks. Art Rocks is made possible by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Hello, thank you for joining us for Art Rocks with me, James Fox Smith, publisher of Country Roads Magazine. We begin with a digital media artist whose early works reflected on the challenges of leaving her homeland, South Korea, to take up residence in the United States. But now, Dr. Hai Yon Nam focuses on bigger issues, ones with irreversible consequences. In her latest ambitious work, Nam combines three-dimensional cityscapes with digital technology to reveal the threat rising sea levels pose to coastal cities like New Orleans. Dr. Nam and collaborator Brendan Harmon talk about this latest work. When I came to Baton Rouge around five years ago, we had 2016 flood and a lot of my friends suffered from that. And that time I realized how nature is very fearful and we should do something to prevent it. At that time, Nam and one of her LSU colleagues, Dr. Brendan Harmon, set out to create three-dimensional graphics to show people just how high water could climb in New Orleans streets when rising sea levels coincided with a major storm. Shifting datum one is about relative sea level rise. The laser moves up and down across the 3D printed model of New Orleans, and that line represents sea level. It starts right at the current sea level, and it slowly rises up, representing the datum, the line, where sea level rise is going to be in the future relative to the city. Of course, New Orleans is behind 20 foot tall levees, but this is showing where the sea level around it is going to be how it's going to be like an island in open water by 2100, unless we do something. Shifting datum two is a simulation of projected sea level rise of approximately five feet uh, by 2100, coupled with a, a major storm. So we're looking at flooding coming from Lake Pontchartrain, inundating part of New Orleans. For some landmarks, we have the French Quarter, the Vieux Carré here with Jackson Square and the Cathedral, uh, the Marigny uh, and Bywater that way. Um, Esplanade's right here. Here is Poitras. Uh, Harris Casino's right here. Here's the cruise terminal with a big cruise boat uh, docked right there. And we have the Superdome back here. It has a computer and a projector hidden in the box underneath. It's a rear projection, so it's projecting up through an acrylic panel underneath the model made of a transparent 3D printed resin models. Dr. Nam has also created 3D resin tiles coated with a layer of epoxy to use in other displays of New Orleans. But before she could dive into high-tech art, she first had to come to grips with how she fit into the American way of life after coming here from Korea. While in graduate school, Nam engaged in a one-woman show as a performing artist. And I realized even though we have a different culture, we have a body. And when I use a body, people in different culture instantly understood it. And then I feel like, oh, this is very similar um, that I am using different tools. So tool was a metaphor. So what I did, I decided to use a different tool. Um, I'm eating stick not with a fork, not with a chopstick, not with a spoon. And I'm sitting a chair, but chair is lopsided, so you keep sliding. And I was walking with really long shoes, really difficult to walk. And I'm drinking orange juice, but my cup, bottom of the cup is cut out. So it just constantly threw away my orange juice. So those are kind of a metaphor, and I feel like how difficult your life could be. Later, I was so lucky to have my show in Smithsonian Portrait Gallery. 
Despite the ongoing challenges of getting used to life in an adopted country, Nam continued to study and to create. I studied graphic elements first to communicate with my audience. And then I learned later digital media and digital art. So I was working more about interactive installation and kinetic installation and sculpture. Then I wanted to know more about technology because for interactive installation, you need to uh, know a lot of uh, programming and coding, other technological support. So I decided to go to PhD and I major in digital media and also minor in computer science. So that I've learned a lot. Recognizing that the human body is the common feature of all shared experience, Nam uses body imagery in several of her works. Floating Identity was my first commission work by company. Um, it's a cosmetic company in Korea and um, they asked us to make some site-specific outdoor sculpture. It was my first commission and I wanted to work with the theme of the company, which is a cosmetic brand. So I started from female face and beauty, but at the same time I chose the site with water because I was thinking that can represent my identity because I feel like I'm moving a lot and I feel like my identity is changing at the same time. And I made three different handles so um, audience can change female face, different expression like a smile and no smile and the closed eyes and open eyes. I always wanted to make something more attractive, something moving, something kinetic, and it was quite successful, I believe. There is a museum at part of Auburn University. They invited artists to have that site-specific sculpture in their garden. And they had a very similar site that I had in Korea. And it was really interesting to see two same work, but slightly different color. When they wanted to erect a sculpture in a park once occupied by both American and Japanese troops, the people of Korea called on Dr. Nam once again. I already started from the history of the site, because you needed to understand that site. That site was moving all the time or changing all the time. So I wanted to have that concept, but at the same time, I wanted to see positive future always. <laughs> So, um, the reason why I put a journey of a footstep because I feel like my life is a journey and also at the same time, sight is changing all the time. So I just decided to use a lot of foot sculpture. It's interactive and kinetic. Um, but at the same time, at the same reason, I didn't use any power supply. So I made a foot pedal. So people just press the foot pedal to activate the foot sculpture up and down. Invisible stream is slightly different. It is interactive, but not only physical interaction, I wanted to visualize a hidden conversation online. Because when people type information online, um, when they think this is anonymous, they sometimes type whatever. So I used the Twitter platform and I gave a lot of uh, derogatory words as keywords. So every 10 seconds they print derogatory word sentence including derogatory words the real time. And robotic arms pick up that um, paper and throw away. So this is interactive, but not just a physical interaction, but also how we can discuss critical, sensitive topic about race. And when I visualize it, it's not hidden anymore. So maybe we can start discussion about it. It's more likely awareness project for me. Seeing artists on TV is lovely, but they and their works are more powerful in person. So here's some of our picks for notable exhibits coming soon to a museum or a gallery near you.
For more about these and many more events in the arts, subscribe to Arts Monthly, the new free e-newsletter from the editors at LPB and Country Roads magazine. What's more, the Art Rocks website features every episode of this program, so to see or share any episode again, log on to lpb.org and navigate to Art Rocks. For most of us, fire, smoke and explosions spell danger, but not for St. Paul, Minnesota artist Lisa Friedrich. Finding order within chaos, Friedrich uses gunpowder, smoke and flame to create beautiful cityscapes of her hometown. I have always been a pyromaniac. Gunpowder is very significant and unusual. I mean, who doesn't love playing with gunpowder, honestly? It's like 4th of July every day. Just fire. I originally started off as an oil painter major, going through a whole bunch of classes. I really liked mixed media, printmaking, and just experimenting with everything got me to experiment with gunpowder. Why not? So the reason I use fire is everyone thinks it's dangerous, which it is. I've had my fair share of burns and, and scars and I have all 10 fingers still, so I'm good there. But the aspect of using what you think is not a medium for artwork is what really intrigues people and it intrigues me. There's kind of a secret to my process and I learned after many experiments putting pressure on gunpowder is what actually adheres the smoke into the paper and creates the image. It's like Christmas every day. I just love trying to control something that can't be controlled. Looks good. Just clean it up a little bit. I clean these really well when I'm framing them because I don't like to see the soot still in, enclosed in the glass. When I first started my gunpowder, it was just abstract. I really wanted to actually make an image. I mainly do landscape pieces. I enjoy actually going to the locations and taking my own photographs. One of my favorite places in the city is the Stone Arch Bridge. I have an obsession with taking images of bridges, and it's just the structure, the smooth lines. I know when I look at a photo, yes, that's gonna work. No, that's not gonna work. Because I, I see the straight lines, I see the dramatic effect it's gonna have, um, and the story it's gonna tell. I am weeding the vinyl. It is cut out in a certain way that I have to slowly peel the image away. And I'm keeping anything that is purple or the actual vinyl, that is what's going to be protected from the, the flames and smoke. And that's essentially what gives me my negative image. So the images are taken from a photograph, and then I have to render them in a way that I know it's going to work for gunpowder. I do have a, a partner in crime. They have actual laser cutters that help me uh, produce the images. The reason I mainly use landscapes, it's something that just looks dramatic. I do the city skyline of Minneapolis, and it kind of tells a story. It looks like the city's on fire, and people really like that aspect of 
my artwork tells a story. I recently got accepted to be one of the 34 artists that will be represented in the new U.S. Bank Stadium for the Minnesota Vikings. Um, I'm very honored to have that. I don't work with a lot of prints. I like the aspect of being able to repeat the image that I have, but the actual burn marks, my ink marks, they are always different. I can never repeat. And so it's, it's always an original, unique piece. Hey, it worked great. I know I'm not the first to, you know, use gunpowder, but I want gunpowder and fire and smoke to be a new exciting medium that's going to lead to people experimenting. When I'm 70, I want to look back and I want to be the girl that's known as the gunpowder girl. The curious incident of the dog in the nighttime tells the tale of a 15-year-old boy on the autism spectrum who is accused of killing his neighbor's dog. And if you can't imagine how that storyline could be both funny and profoundly moving, come to Boston, Massachusetts with us as we speak with an actor playing the lead role in Simon Stevens' hit play. From the second the play starts, we were like, all right, come on this journey with us, like be incorporated into this world. Doors open! Is this the train to Wilson Junction? Here, the audience is fully immersed in the world of 15-year-old Christopher, a boy who has difficulty processing the life around him. And yet he marches alone into it in a quest to solve the murder of his neighbor's dog. Or as the title of the play describes it, the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime. He loves mysteries and he loves Sherlock Holmes, so he kind of takes on that persona. And when he starts to go down that rabbit hole, he finds several other mysteries that need to be solved. Actor and Vermont native Adam Langdon plays Christopher in the first touring production of the hit Tony winning play. The circumstances of Christopher's life are narrated through his teacher, reading his journal entries. Siobhan says that if you raise one eyebrow, it can mean lots of different things. It can mean, I want to do sex with you. But what Christopher feels, how he experiences life, is conveyed through an assaulting array of imagery, light, and sound. Christopher is a young man acutely susceptible to his senses. Then the next left turn, then every right turn, and so on, and so on, and that was how I found the station. Ah! It's really to just uh, to show what's going on with Christopher and to really put it, uh, the audience in his mind. All the actors on stage, they're just his brain microbes. Ever since the publication of Mark Haddon's novel of the same name in 2004, observers have labeled Christopher autistic. But very deliberately, the word never appears in either the book or the play. If I went around being like, this is what Christopher is, I, that would be so wrong of me. He's, he's his own individual. Playing Christopher is a demanding task. Just like the sensory explosions, we see every physical contortion that racks the teenager as he negotiates his way through teeming cities and congested train platforms. I like never worked out or did anything like that. And the show itself is a workup. <laughs> It's a mindset also that you have to be like, right, Christopher is like this incredibly brave young man, so you have to be brave for him. So if you're gonna like be kneeling on people's shoulders and fall backwards, 
you just have to do it, and then you have to do it again when it's not right, and do it again and again and again and again and again until it's until it's good. He was fully prepped for the part, though. Langdon's Juilliard classmate Alex Sharp originated the role on Broadway and won the Tony for Best Actor. When Langdon landed the show, Sharp became a mentor. The main thing that I remember from our first talk was. If you need to talk to me, I am on call anytime, any day, whatever. And if you don't want to talk to me at all, that is also okay. And I definitely did want to talk to him and, you know, have a beer with someone who's like been through everything you've been going through in rehearsal is like very, very good. Not to mention, it satisfied his curious curiosity. Michigan-based singer-songwriter Olivia Millishan is doing what many young people dream of, performing on stage with multiple instruments and a talented band behind her. Millishan's soulful style blends genres from present day to yesteryear. Take a listen. If you want it so bad, go and get it yourself. What I've always wanted my music to do is just to give people hope, some sort of light to a dark situation. So hopefully that's what it does for people. But you'd rather go and hurt yourself or anyone else in the way. I grew up listening to what my parents listened to, so I've always really loved Carole King and Simon and Garfunkel. And, and when I first started writing, I felt like, oh, I want to be like them. And then the older I get, the more I'm influenced by other things. I listen to every genre now. Wear your coat, she said, don't want you to freeze. It's taken a long time to find the sound, and I don't think, I, I still haven't. Still, everybody's always trying to find their sound. I think our sound can best be described as Jazz, folk, singer, songwriter, uh, if that's a genre, a mix of every genre. Um, and it's, it's still working its way out, but it, it, I think I developed it by working with the musicians that surround me. My most recent record I recorded in New York with Chris Cubetta and a songwriter named Wakey Wakey, and they really helped form the sound of, of Look Both Ways. For so long I was performing solo, and, um, and with the, the new records and adding more instruments, we, we end up bringing people on. I play uh, mainly ukulele, guitar, and keys, but it's hard to do that when I have such an incredible band. I can't make excuses to, to play when they're so good. Today I'm performing with Sonia Lee, Bob Mervek, and James Pine. We're going to be doing Look Both Ways, which is the title track and When, which is a song that features uh, the 2015 winner of The Voice, but he's not here today. And then um, Time Out, which is an older kind of burlesque sounding song. Look Both Ways is a bit more serious for me. A lot of my music's really happy and sunshiny, but Look Both Ways is, is about people not necessarily treating you well or, or showing you their good side, but realizing that they still have a good side that maybe you just can't acknowledge or see right now. I look both ways before I cross that street So tell me how the hell did I not see You come and come for speed ahead You come and come for me instead You come and come for speed ahead for me When is a love song. It's, it's just an unconditional love song. Um, I was trying to write more songs that I could sing at weddings, to be honest, um, and it just happened. I actually wrote it on Mackinac Island, so it was inspired by the love of Mackinac. <laughs> Time Out is like the most unkind song I've ever written, I think. It's about wanting to put a girl in time out for uh, messing with your man. Uh, I don't know how else to explain it, <laughs> but that's what that one's about. When I'm writing or when I'm performing, um, what I hope that the audience can take from it is I hope they can somehow relate it to their own lives and the new, the new album, Look Both Ways, is all about seeing the good side do something that isn't always good. And some people think that's dark, but I think that's the complete opposite. So hopefully it can help somebody with whatever they're going through, or make their goods even better. 
Surprisingly, a lot of people, especially online, young people have reached out and, and said I, I had a woman reach out to me a couple weeks ago and she said that she lost both of her parents when she was young and she, she's part of a, they make, they make a joke out of it because they don't know how else to deal with it. She's part of a dead parents club, it's like a support group and she said that they listen to my new album every week before they have their meetings and I just think that's incredible. I think as musicians and, and as anything, no matter what you're doing, that's why you why you get into it in the first place. You just hope that it affects other people like it affects you. So the fact that people can get something positive from it and, and it can help them in any way possible is really all I could ask for. Top into mediocre, low into fabulous is what I always tell my band when they, when they ask how they did. Um, and what I tell myself. I think I stole that phrase from Bob Murvac, who's who plays keys for me. Because I just think I can't take myself too seriously. Even if, uh, most of the time we're critical, but even if I think I did a good job, I'm like, not that good. You can always do better. <laughs> For speed ahead for me And you are You were coming For speed ahead For me And that is that for this edition of Art Rocks. But never mind, you can find, share and send episodes of the show at lpb.org slash Art Rocks. And if you want more insight into the art and culture of Louisiana, Country Roads Magazine is a great resource for learning what's going on in the arts all across the state. So until next week, I'm James Fox Smith, and thanks to you for watching.